gravity is a is a a great example of a lot of the things you're talking about here today. Um, certainly, commitment, taking a risk, looking for. I mean, that was the movie that when it landed on the desk, I said, "Well, here's something I think we've never seen before, and there's a way we could do this that's never been done before." And that happened very early in the process. And it became a process of just of trying to prove that out. Um, the aha moment in the movie uh, never really came. Actually, we never really. And I honestly say this. We, we knew it would look kind of, we, we knew it would look good. We really didn't know if the movie would hang together. And um, it finished so late, as you can imagine, because it was, you know, it was all visual effects, right? It was all CG work. And it finished so late that by the time the movie was starting to come in and we were seeing shots, in some respects, a lot of the people that were involved in the film, or at least at the studio site, had somewhat given up on the movie. They were kind of going, ah, you know what, it's going to be fine. And they gave it kind of not a very good date. You know, and they didn't have high expectations for it, which is a wonderful place to be. Uh, and I think the aha moment for me, and I'm sure it was for Alfonso, really came uh, when we went to Venice and played it one night for the, the critics, the night before it was going to uh, you know, premiere at the Venice Film Festival. And we were proud of the movie. We liked the way it looked, but we had no idea. And the next morning we were walking around the Piazza San Marco, uh, kind of waiting for some reaction. And I absolutely remember my Blackberry going off and looking down. And there was uh, the first review coming in from Variety, which was spectacular. It was unbelievable. And we just started literally laughing out loud in the middle of the streets of Venice. We were surprised. One of the great offshoots of, of the, the changes in technology and the sort of the movement over to a digital workflow, certainly away from a photochemical workflow and, um, and even away from a script-based workflow, uh, has been uh, all of these wonderful, as you say, the vizs, the post-viz, pre-viz, um, pitch viz. Um, what that's done is, you know, in a sense, that's, that is, in, in another manufacturing, you'd call that rapid prototyping. And, uh, and that really has been, that's actually the term that I like best of all. Because it's allowed us to have a very fluid movement of ideas, very quickly, um, in and around, both on a micro level in the editorial room with the filmmakers and on a macro level, you know, with the studio very early on. What that means is that the studio has seen things early on, you know, tailoring their marketing around it, tailoring their expectations around it. So that's, it's been really important in the relationship with the studio and the studio's distribution. Um, and then obviously it's been, it's terrific, these are terrific tools for the filmmakers, particularly to share, share amongst themselves on a film, particularly on a very complicated film. So that, I mean, these are, these are revolutionary developments and changes. Um, I think the other aspect of it is, and this is something not often talked about, is that, that yeah, the vizs, the pitch, the post-viz and pre-viz, these are, you know, like, the rapid prototyping tools. They're also really interesting tools that allow um, access into the creative process by so many different people. Uh, and it's made, I think, the, the creative part of filmmaking a little less linear and a little less uh, hierarchical. You can have a really good previs artist who can make a tremendous contribution to a film by conceiving of a shot in a new way, getting it through the director and it makes its way in. Right? Or you can have a, a concept artist you know, submit something that's just been on assignment from a production designer that just can move a whole movie towards a different idea about how to render a scene. And I like that idea. I like these tools that I think are opening uh, the whole process up a bit to different voices who are already there. They were there on the film, but in the past, um, I don't think they had access. I actually think we're in a period right now where there's a, there's a, a bit of a pushback against pre -vis. Not so much post-viz. Post-viz is really important, obviously, because it's an editorial tool. Uh, but the pre -vis, I think, right now, I'm, I'm writing to a lot of filmmakers that are kind of pushing back, saying, for two reasons, both practical and, and, and creative. The one, the reason I like best, is that, that uh, it, it does sort of pull some of the spontaneity out. I also think uh, of the filmmaking process. If you've planned every shot, you know the lens, it kind of makes the on-set um, event somewhat dry. I also think we've moved to an aesthetic right now, certainly with camera, which is moving away from a really planned camera on a, on a crane, you know, the move of which has been agreed upon everybody before we do it. I think we're seeing a little bit more of a looser camera right now in films, uh, a bit of a reactive camera, and that doesn't necessarily isn't consistent with the pre -vis aesthetic. Uh, I think the real reason, though, that I'm getting some pushback on pre -vis is because um, we are now having to tailor the pre -vis beyond just helping us solve technical problems, or even helping us prototype sort of a creative idea. The previs is now being, you know, being raised to a level that it becomes a real presentation tool, and it has to sort of hit that mark. So it's a tremendous amount of work, because we're mixing music in, sound effects, we're editing it, re-editing it again, we're going much past any real practical usefulness, just because 
that the filmmakers are afraid that some of the ex a studio executives is going to see it and, and look at it like it's almost a finished film and then suddenly start giving criticisms and it opens up that whole process uh, too early in the overall creative process of a film. I think the visual effects business is just in a, in a huge transition period and uh, those of us that have to work on it every day and still get movies out are just trying to make smart choices while we watch the business evolve away from really um, one sort of manufacturing model to another. Uh, there's so many forces at work here, uh, and, uh, and the, the major forces, I think, that are at work here, um, that, are, that are sort of creating the, 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 many of the things you're talking about here, the bankruptcies we're seeing, the um, government subsidized labor, the you know, changes in um, uh, uh, the business models that are you know, infecting all of the companies right now. I think these are all symptoms of a, of a sort of larger movement right now that um, Technology has become ubiquitous. The tools that we're using have become standardized. The workforces have become increasingly mobile and trained. And that all is pointing to a large part of the work that we're doing can be, it's almost commoditized. It's price is a single determinant. And so now for a large part of the work that I have to oversee, we are just shopping price, which is different than it's been in the past. Um, but that, I don't think that's a tragedy. I think um, it, while we can point to that as something that seems to have devalued the work, what really is happening is that the, what we call visual effects have affected, are infecting every line item on the budget. You look at a budget of a film and you see everything's broken down into categories of transportation, sets, you know, construction, second unit, and there's this little thing called visual effects. But it's kind of absurd because through all of the departments, we're, we're doing visual effects. It's crowds and extras, it's wardrobe for the crowds, it's vehicles, it's environments. So the amount of work that's being done with these tools is, is growing exponentially. Necessarily, a large part of that is beginning, gonna become subject to the, sort of the tools that, that we were talking about. It's gonna become commoditized. But there still is a tremendous amount of work, right, that is just about innovation and about groundbreaking work and fantastic aesthetic. And I think that, separating those two out is a transition that we're in the middle of. I think we're going to end up in a couple of years in a much calmer place where there'll be what one might call the high-end work, the innovative work, the work based on R&D and new tools development, and that will be following one, one financial model. And then there'll be sort of the rest of the work, which, as I say, is woven through all of the departments, and for which price will be the single determinant. But I think everybody will be okay with it at that point, uh, as they are with other parts. I think we're just going to become more like manufacturing and other businesses. I'm very impressed this year. Um, I can feel, I mean, the programs are always incredible. And, uh, and you know, the work continues to be mind-bending, and then the programs are therefore mind-bending as we go down and look at what people are working on. Uh, what I am impressed this year, I know it was a case in the past, but it really feels that this year is that, in some respects, this is very much a community-building um, uh, event. And it's not just that, yeah, okay, everybody goes out and has dinner afterwards, but the, the, the sort of free exchange of ideas and then the bonds that are built out of that, I'm really feeling this year, and I'm and particularly feeling the value of that.